Um, first, thank you for the, the invitation to come speak. Um, I'm very proud to be able to do this work and be able to do, talk about this work in the Central Valley, uh, it being about the Central Valley. Uh, to give you a little bit of background, uh, this is the beginning of sort of the preliminary stages of the research on my second book, uh, which is sort of tentatively kind of thinking about water, land, and race in particular. Uh, what we'll be talking about today is uh, very, very sort of complicated water issues along with kind of the ways in which uh, activists have tried to challenge the status quo in particular around agriculture in the Central Valley uh, and more specifically in an area we call the Westlands Water District. Are people familiar at all with the Westlands Water District? It's in the news like crazy right now and I'll talk about a little bit about why that is. Um, but again, it's a sort of a preliminary research. I'm going to do have to do a little bit of background so that you guys can kind of understand where I'm coming from. <clears throat> but at the end of the day, like what I'm really interested in is, is resistance, right? How do people resist um, the conditions that they uh, live in, um, that they work in, that they you know try to survive in? Um, so the water stuff gets complicated, so if you just sort of uh, bear with me, but I think in, in general, kind of overall, it's also about being very critical of this kind of romantic vision that we have of the food movement and of food studies and agri California agriculture in general. And so, you know, we'll, some of this stuff will be familiar, and then some of it hopefully will be uh, new to you. Um, first, I think we start out with the kind of facts that I think people are probably familiar with here in this room is that as time has gone, especially in post-World War II era, farmers are they're becoming, there are fewer farms and their size continues to increase. And so we see this moment here right around the 1950s and 60s where they're passing each other, right? And farms continue to grow in size and fewer and fewer people are involved in agriculture uh, by the 1990s. Uh, we're looking at something around like 2% of the population is in some way connected to agriculture, which is a, obviously a huge departure from the ways that this country was sort of origi or originated. This is a country. For the purpose of today's talk, right, I think we really need to become familiar with the 1902 Newlands Reclamation Act which authorized uh, the federal government to subsidize and build irrigation projects in the arid west, right? And so how do we bring water to places that don't get water, right? In particular, the Central Valley would look at anywhere between five to nine inches of rain every year. So how do you have an agricultural behemoth in an area that doesn't have rainfall? And the solution to that ultimately was the Newlands, irrigation, the Newlands uh, Reclamation Act. It was supposed to be in its, in its uh, function a way of subsidizing family farmers uh, to grow, go out and settle, right? This new, newly opened land wasn't specifically for the purpose of irrigation, but really sort of a homestead act, right? It was a way of trying to populate the arid regions of the country and in Central Valley, uh, California in particular. The land size was supposed to be limited to 160 acres per farm. Okay? So if you were going to receive irrigated, irrigation, right, if you were going to receive water from the federal government, from these uh, dams and canals, et cetera, et cetera, your farm was supposed to not exceed 160 acres. Again, this is very much kind of... Uh, invested in this Jeffersonian democracy, right? The small landholders are able to participate more fully in democracy and to keep in check uh, the kind of rampant power of the monopolies and things like that, right? And so this is supposed to uh, stall that out, right? Uh, those people who owned land that was in excess of 160 acres uh, had to sign what were called recordable contracts. And under recordable contracts, you were forced within a 10-year period to sell your excess land at prices that reflected pre-irrigation value, right? So dirt cheap, essentially, right? And so the idea was that these large landholders would, you'd be breaking up these monopolies of these large landholders in the Central Valley. And at the time, we're looking at railroads, right? This is mostly owned by railroad conglomerates that are then supposed to be selling off uh, this land. So just to give you a kind of sense of 
what was expected right, when this bill was passed, uh, F.H. Newell, which is the first commissioner of reclamation, summarized the purpose of the Reclamation Act in 1902 by saying that the object of the Reclamation Act is not so much to irrigate land as it is to make homes. It is not to irrigate lands which now belong to large corporations or to small ones. It's not to make these men wealthy, but it's to bring about a condition whereby that land shall be put in the hands of smaller owners. So there's not really any debate, although now there's debate about the intention of the writers of the law, but there really wasn't any debate at the time of what the intention of these type of laws were. It was to populate homestead and break up large land holdings in the West. <clears throat> so what does that look like uh, in California? Uh, the one that is going to be the most familiar or should be the most familiar to all of us is the Central Valley Project. Right? And so the Central Valley Project, which begins construction uh, in 1924, is really ultimately about sort of watering the Central Valley. And so this is a photo of a pre-dam Shasta area. Right? So this is what it looked like. You can see the drawing, the outline here of where they're going to put uh, the dam. Uh, and ultimately, uh, this is obviously, those of you who have been there, this is what it looks like now. Right? Well, not now, because now <laughs> it's mostly empty. Right? So again, the Central Valley Project starts out as this kind of very um, hopeful moment, right? And it's an agreement between the federal government and the state uh, to provide water for, uh, uh, you know, uh, homesteaders. <clears throat> Unfortunately, uh, what happens ultimately, right, is that uh, we don't have uh, the kind of enforcement that would have been necessary in order to keep these land holdings into small hands. So almost immediately, there's various different ways in which the landholders uh, challenge this law, right? First, one of the first things that they do, well, they interpret the law as saying 160 acres per person and not per farm. And so what they do is they put in the name, land in the name of their wives, in the name of their children, in the name of their cousins, of their, you know, uh, in-laws twice removed, they just start putting the, the land in trusts. They start putting the land in a whole bunch of different, uh, in a whole bunch of different names in order to sort of avoid the law and skirt around it. And so what I want to sort of think about here, right, is uh, one of the things that I want to do with the work is really challenge the concept of family farm, right, and the idea of a family farm and what a family farm is. In 1981, the Department of the Interior, who was sort of gearing up for a challenge to the law in 81, um, writes uh, sort of their draft environmental impact statement uh, about what it would mean to break up these large land holdings. And one of the things that they find, or one of the things that they do, is that they change the definition of family farm. To not mean, uh, you know, a family that owns a farm, but instead to think about the relationship between the family and labor and that farm. Right? And so using this definition that argued the majority of the work on the farm has to be done by family and immediate members of the family, right? This is how the Department of the Interior classifies this uh, in 1981. And since labor requirements vary from crop to crop, right, uh, that labor, that the size of farms was less irrelevant to them than what kind of work was being done. And so put it in, uh, you know, grapes or strawberries, you know, 40 to like 60 to 70 acres is probably enough. I mean, a family can probably do that kind of work. Where we're looking at cotton or alfalfa, you could do as much as like 1,000 acres with one family, right? And so the Department of the Interior begins to kind of argue, this is the way that we should be thinking about this relationship, is the relationship to labor. And it's something that uh, I really sort of am trying to think about in, our wor in my work and thinking about uh, ways to talk about this. All right, so this is uh, the Westlands Water District. And it's over 600,000 acres of farms, or roughly the size of Rhode Island. All right, and this is uh, the 99 here in Fresno here and then the I-5 going up along this way. So it's in between uh, the I-5 and, uh, and the 99. 
1981, when the Department of Interior conducted this research, they discovered that the average farm size in the Westlands Water District was 1,600 acres, right? So well over the 160 acre limitation. And that 92% of the farms in the Westlands Water District were in violation of the Reclamation Act. There were about 300 farms operating 600,000 acres with 5,000 full-time employees and several thousand more seasonal workers, right? So again, you know, these are almost exclusively owned, um, <clears throat> with the exception of a handful of corporations, almost exclusively owned by individual families, right? So some of them you'll probably recognize, like the J.G. Boswell, right? Um, the Giffins, the Harrises, Murrietas. This is their land out here, the 600,000 acres. The other three largest landholders behind J.G. Boswell in this area are Chevron, Standard Oil, and Shell. And that's who owns, those are the three largest owners besides the Boswells, and then the other family farms follow not too far behind, okay? We're still talking in like thousands and tens of thousands of acres. <clears throat> and so in some ways, we want to, I, mean, I want to assure you that this is not um, uh, deviate from the rest of, the Cal rest of California, right? In California, we're looking at uh, something around in 2007, we had about 5,000 farms uh, out of 81,000 farms that accounted for almost 90% of all annual cash receipts from, um, uh, from farm, late, from farm uh, revenue, right? And so a lot of times people will say, well, there's 70,000 small farms in California, right? Or 75,000, 76,000 small farms in California. And while that's true in terms of uh, uh, the numbers, the reality of it is, is together, these, these farms account for less than 5% of all annual cash receipts in California. Right. That's as of 2007. And so we can, we, can, you know, we can sort of echo what Kerry McWilliams said so many years ago, is that really what we're dealing with are industrial farms, or are we dealing with factories in the field? This is what we have, large scale corporate farms operating with thousands of seasonal workers uh, on, their dole, on, their, on their payrolls. So given this, like I said, I think I'd like to suggest uh, that whether or not a farm is owned by a single family should not play into our definition of what a family farm is, but instead to think about the relationship between labor right, and the family and the farm. So for example, one of the names that I mentioned, uh, Harris Farms, which is owned and operated by John C. Harris, farms 19,552 irrigated acres and employs 618 regular, em regular employees and thousands of seasonal farm workers. Now why is this ultimately important? The first thing I want to say is, um, you know, that this is, in, like I said, indicative uh, of, of California, uh, but also sort of to understand the kind of challenges that we're talking about when we're talking about family farms, the F California food revolution, these kind of, uh, this kind of rhetoric that exists, right, uh, since the 1970s, since Chez Panisse and all of this stuff that we, we'll be reading about, right, in 30 years, the size of these operations has not changed. Right? In the 30 years of the food revolution, this has not changed. So I would suggest that there actually has not been a revolution, <laughs> unless you're very wealthy. So the other question here is like, why does this matter? Why does the size of farms matter? Um, you know, Mark Arax, who's a great journalist, who's very well known in the Central Valley, has written about some of this, and his argument is ultimately, uh, what well, you can't operate on this smaller scale. You can't farm this area on small scales. Yeah, I agree. The you know, Arax will tell you, yes, this is messed up. It's terrible. It's, uh, corp you know, it's corrupt. But you can't farm this kind of land on such a small scale. Part of what I want to do is sort of unpack that and say, well, first, maybe they shouldn't be farmed at all. But, but let's say it is. Right? The other problem that occurs 
is the kind of sort of social conditions that exist in this. There have been two studies that have been done, <clears throat> one by a guy named Goldschmidt in the 1970s where he started to relate, the, he started to uh, uh, correlate the relationships between social conditions in, in rural communities that are close to family farms and, and, and close in terms of location, and then also uh, the, the conditions of communities that are close to corporate farms. Right? And what he found is that there's an inverse relationship. Right? The bigger the farm gets, the worse the quality of life becomes. Right? And <clears throat> he does this uh, in the South, and the professor at UC Davis actually, named Dean McCannell in the 1980s, starts to replicate these studies. Right? So Goldsmith does it in the South, and then he does it in Arvin and Dinuba. Right? And so then McCannell starts to try to replicate these findings and is doing exactly that. He's replicating the findings in the Central Valley that the closer you live to these large corporate farms, the fewer schools there are, the fewer churches there are, the fewer jobs there are, the, the fewer civil, civil service or civil, uh, or civil society that exists in these communities. Uh, the migrant workers are paid less on average. Right? They live in worse conditions, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's this direct relationship with farm size and social conditions. I've spoken with Dean McCannell on a number of, number of different occasions, and hopefully things have changed to Davis, but ultimately he argued that this is the reason that he doesn't end up having a prolific career in agriculture at UC Davis because of this study. Right? Essentially, he argues that he gets run out because of this work. What's interesting, right, if you look at the Westlands Water District, which is the area that he was really sort of focusing on, they did not have a high school within the 600,000 acre area until uh, 1997, right? And the, and the uh, school, the elementary school in this, in this area, I'm gonna go back here one, kind of go back. <clears throat> There's these little communities here, Cantua Creek, and th three rocks. Oops. Hey, that's a touch screen. <laughs> they have one elementary school here right in the middle. And the elementary school, the principal also operates the farm labor camp. Yeah. That's today? That's today. 